Welcome to Iron Sights. This podcast candidly seeks to create opportunities and deliver impact by sharing the experiences and wisdom of successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders who unapologetically aim to win in health, fitness, business, and life. I'm your host, Scott Howell. Welcome to Old School Meets New School. Tradition meets innovation and imperfection meets excellence. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Ah, so I want to welcome to the show today. I got my good friend, longtime friend, Brian Kramer. Brian is a uh, business performance coach to executives. He's also a virtual speaker. C and he's the CEO at H2H companies. Uh, he's got, he's got quite a resume. He's, uh, a best-selling author of not one, but two books. The first book is There Is No B2B or B2C. It's Human to Human, H to H. And the second book is Shareology, How Sharing is Powering Human Economy. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in here. Brian, it seems to me you've sort of always been sort of a, a head or, or above, however you want to look at it, the digital marketing curve and the human to human movement, even way before the TED talk that I heard you give way back in 2014. Um, what is H2H and what inspired it? Well, um, first of all, awesome to be sitting across the table from a guy I've known since kindergarten. <laughs> it's been kind, a while. Kind of weird and fun. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, H2H is something that we have been talking about since... Um, well, so Courtney and I, my wife and I, uh, started an agency, Pure Matter. Um, still have the agency and co-own it in a different form now. Um, we started it in 2002, and not shortly after that, we started talking about HH and human, human to human. Um, and at that point, we're talking about it in a different sense than it was when we started actually talking about it in the social sense. And so when in 2005-ish, we were talking about it with clients around how it was going to create a new sense of how it works with websites. Because websites was like the thing. How do you create websites for people that could connect people into buying your product? Right, we're talking 2002, right? So this 2002 is- to 2005, when websites were like That's simple it. HTML websites, mm-hmm. like, I want to buy your stuff. I go to www.red.fitness. Right. I mean, we worked on your website right. together, I think, right. Ron. Yep. And, um, and you go to the web and you do this thing. And so, um, you know, that is that is when I graduated college. Was was uh, I was a public relations major, strangely Japanese minor, and, and don't ask me why. I just saw a sign that says Japanese this way, and I signed up. Um, and then... So I uh, got into an, an agency um, uh, uh, out of college uh, that hired me to do websites. And the reason I started doing that was because um, uh, I failed a jazz test in college. <laughs> um, why did jazz history get me into doing websites? I failed the test. The guy, my professor said, um, you got an F. And I went up to him afterwards. I'm like, why do I want to fill a jazz history test on Gillespie? Like, who does that? And I said, um, how, how do I how do I do that? And he said, well, the the, the URL that you put down for your um, your 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 whole uh, reference is gone. And I'm like, and, and that's that's what you mean. The, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Like it did when you saw it, but it doesn't now. It's 24 hours earlier, as we all did our our we homework, you know. Right. And and I went in, and I went in and I, I was like. Well, he said, just go find it and send it to me and I'll correct your grade. And, and I was like, great. I went back to my dorm room and I was like, it's gone. Sure it's enough, not here. it's not there anymore. So I went to the uh, bookstore and I bought a few books on HTML and I went back to my dorm room and I, I wrote some HTML. It was like kind of cool and I was excited about it. And I rewrote the whole page and I redid it 
Yeah, so wait, 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 time out, time out. So what you're doing here is you're actually fabricating a page that you, that used to be there. You're putting it back together so you can return in this assignment. I wanted a name. I got you, man. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> There's no other way around it. Yeah, totally you can't it. go do something that isn't there. So I'm going to get this A for me because gotcha. I'm a, that's important. So um, so I did it and and uh, built the page, sent it back over to him. He reversed the grade and um, and I'm like, well, this is this could be something. This could be really neat to build pages for people. So I did. I started making money in college, building websites for people. Things started to get around, and I started making some money and. <laughs> Then I combined my communications degree with digital and it started to like really intrigue me how people could start to do this thing. But how do you humanize is what started to become this thing. Long story short about where did HH come from? And so when we started to get into into the um, agency business uh, years later, as Courtney and I started the agency, it was like, OK, how do we humanize digital um, now? Then in um, around 20 uh, I think it was around 2015, I was standing on stage at, um, at uh, Bloomberg in San Francisco, and I was standing there and all of a sudden um, the screen was behind me in the middle of a presentation. It was the right audience. It was all these executives, CMOs, marketers, all marketers. And, um, and I had the screen up. It said, there's no B2B here. There's no B2C. It's HH, human to human. And I described what was going on in the environment. Now, this is when social media was first present. Right. So we're talking like Facebook is really taking off. Wait, and we're talking 2014, 15 right. at this point. OK, so it's it's full steam ahead right now. Everybody's on it. Everybody's trying to figure it out. Right. Which isn't that far ago. No, it's like yesterday. This is not that far ago. Right. Like social is still new, right. even though it feels like table stakes these days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. So we're sitting there and we're talking about, you know, how do you be human on social and what does it mean? And what does it mean now that companies actually don't get to just do ads and say what they want and you have to listen? Like right. as a person, as a customer, I get to speak what I want to speak. That changes the game. Totally. I get to say what I want about your business and you have to hear what I get to say. Right. And I'm standing on stage saying this kind of stuff. And here I am at Bloomberg with CMOs in the audience and they're going, this is oh, horrible. Shit. Yeah, we're in big trouble. Yeah. And this is new at the time. Now, today, looking back, we all have guidelines and know what to do when somebody says this. But then it was like, well, yeah, you're right. What do we do if they say that? Right. And so when I got to the HH screen, it was like, well, now this changes the game for business to business and business to consumer. It doesn't matter which company you are. Right. On the outside, the customer doesn't care. The customer cares about whether they're going to get what they paid for. The customer cares about actually hearing from another human at the company right. about how they're going to be treated. And you could be happy or uh, it's all about how they're how they're being treated and also about how fast they're going to get their stuff. Right. So um, so when I did that, it kind of shocked me kind of like this is the part where I didn't um, know this was coming. You mean the reaction from the audience, the reaction from gotcha. the audience. Gotcha. Totally. So I was, sta I was standing there and, all, and I went to the next screen and, and then the MC said, wait a second, go back to that slide. And I'm like, OK, and went back to the slide and, and he lifted his phone and I kind of leaned over a little mm -hmm. bit like photo op. I remember this. And yeah. uh, and I don't know. I, I don't know. I, it's like a Gaylord Fokker move. I just kind of <laughs> leaned into it. And and then um, and then everybody else kind of like lifted, followed suit, took pictures and and they all posted on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and um, and it, it just took off. There's a hundred. We measured it like good marketers, and there's 124 million uh, mentions of HH across the world and 17 different languages of HH, and it just blew up. How long did that take? Uh, 24 hours. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like you're pioneering a huge movement at this point. Well, the the movement had been happening. It just hadn't maybe put into the context that you put it in um, to these big companies that are looking at it going. Wow. Okay. So we've got to change the game um, and we got to do it fast. Right. So they're, they're freaking out a little bit. Yeah. They're freaking out and, um, and they're trying to figure out what, what do we do? What are, what are the policies we put in place? Um, what do we tell our, our employees? Um, how, how do we treat our customers? 
um, what's going to happen to our products, our services. Um, they're trying to figure out what do we do if somebody says something bad on the spot immediately? Mm -hmm. how, how fast do we have to respond? Um, there's just like a thousand things that just changed. And so they have a lot that they have to figure out. Um, so that was just radically awesome. I, I just think it was the coolest part of all of history and man and, 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 and everything that just happened. It was just like, wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and so our people cl are just clamoring to talk to you and try to figure, th figure this out and say, Brian, tell us what you know, because they're realizing this and you're now the answer guy. Yeah. Well, two things happened. I either became hated or loved. Right. Um, f uh, everybody either showed up and, and, um, well, you just made everybody question their value as an employee, right? And their structure as a company. That's yeah. Those are tough questions to answer. Well, and I also made them question the whole B two B and B two C thing. So LinkedIn, if you looked at LinkedIn back then, they said, "What do you mean B two B and B two C is a process?" Mm -hmm. We're you know, there's definitely there's a, a difference yeah. between the two, and I'm like, that's not what I'm questioning. Of course, you know. Like you're a, you are um, Red Dot Fitness is a B to C. You're serving consumers. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a process. Um, business to business is a, you know uh, is going to serve a uh, business is going to serve a business. That's not what I'm what what I was arguing. What I was arguing is that um, a consumer doesn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. A consumer sees that they're going to spend their money on something and they expect to receive a response. They don't care. And so externally, they're just purchasing what they are purchasing. They don't care. And so um, re-explaining that over and over and over again, I'm like, yeah, of course, internally, sure. You go do your thing and, and externally, that's it. So, um, so that's where that ended up. And, and, um, and then, yes, it, it kind of spun things out of place. So I did, um, I went home from the thing, Courtney and I are, you know, our heads are spinning and yeah, because I, now you got to be questioning how you're handling your own customers, right? From a marketing perspective and what, what they're doing. Uh, well, our, our own agency yep. clients were like, Oh wow, this is awesome. Right. And we got, our clients were just amazed and, and they were, they were grateful that they were working with us at the time. Cause that it built our thought leadership up. And, right. um, it also, um, uh, left a lot of questions around, a, and if we didn't answer that right, then somebody else was going to, and mm -hmm. we knew that. Things were moving fast. And so we went home. I had been writing about HJH, uh, blogging about it for four or five years, two years before that, at least really specifically. And so Courtney and I sat down for four days uh, four nights, 24 hours for four days, and, and literally wrote a, uh, and edited a book together. Pulled all the content together. And it was there. Writing. It was yeah. all there because we had been writing it. There's no way we would have been had been able to do that. So we, we edited it together and wrote a, edited a book together based on everything that had been written and, and uh, self-published it and sold, um, I think, about 15,000 books uh, almost immediately because of right. the way that that all rolled out and took advantage of the, the moment, but also took advantage of, or made sure that we answered the question, which was, what does HH mean and how do you answer this call of what, what just happened with social? Uh, defined it, defined what does HH mean and what are the pillars of HH and how do you, how do you, what do you do with all this stuff that's happening so that, you know, people could actually make something of this, not just like, what is human to human? Well, it's two people that are talking. That's not, right. that's not going to help you. So you've got people now that are, that are racing to try to figure this whole thing out in kind of a different way. They have a little bit of a different perspective of perspective of it now. And, you know, I imagine you're, you're trying to sell the book. You've, you've sold a bunch of copies of it, but you don't just publish a book, put it on Amazon and sell a bunch of copies of the book. There's promotion of the book, then there's a business that you're trying to run and you're trying to be a husband and a dad and all the things. What's happening in life? Like, like what are you doing? You traveling all over the place? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I knew I knew you then. Um, you saw what was going on. I, I turned into this um, traveling machine right. and I was getting called all over the place, all over the world to start going and speaking and getting a into uh, some really amazing places. I, I, I was, I felt at first I felt lucky and my skill set was evolving as a speaker and 
Um, and then my, my, the, 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 um, way that I thought about H to H started to evolve. And then also so did technology and, and tech and, um, and then even just artificial intelligence and augmented reality and automation and all of this stuff started to evolve. And, and so now all of a sudden I'm starting to get fascinated with, with everything that's out there. And, and, and at some point I'm, I'm on the road now, hundred and I don't know, 175 days a year. That's hard. And I'm, and it's not glamorous. Um, I'm on the road 175 days a year. You know how that, yep. Been there, done that. that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, you're on planes. Um, I'm, I'm in really cool hotels. I'm, yeah, I'm eating incredible food alone. <laughs> um, I'm going through lots of x-ray machines. Um, I got to know a lot of good people at the x-ray machines and, um, you know, I got to know a lot of people, um, you know, at airports, the flight I, crews, could, yeah. I could call them all by first name right. and uh, flight crews and, you know, all that. And, and um, club sandwiches at midnight were my favorite. Oh, those club sandwiches were so good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was just living the life, but wasn't. It wasn't like I'd get to a hotel room and I'd FaceTime Courtney and say, oh, my God, look at the view at this penthouse. And it was in, in Italy. Right. And then I'd go to bed. Right. And wake up and give a keynote and get on an airplane and move to the next spot, fly to Bulgaria or somewhere and, and be like, OK, you know, and I wouldn't. You know, so it was really neat and I loved it. I got to meet some incredible people and I m- learned so much. But there's a different side to that. It's yeah. different than than um, than vacation travel, if you will. So it, it wasn't what it's built up to be. It'll take its toll. Yeah. It'll take its toll on you mentally. It'll take its toll on you physically. And when those things start to happen, yeah, then it'll take its toll on other things in terms of your your relationships yeah. and uh, you know your health in general. It did. Yeah, it did I put on? Oh, I put on how much? Sixty pounds, I think. Sixty five pounds. Hmm. That's a substantial amount of weight in a short period of time. Yeah. Right. So you don't just do that, and your body responds favorably to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got a little bit of a story there, you know, maybe kind of walk us through it a little bit. So the first starts with the weight and mm. then what happens next? Oh, it's like a backwards country song. <laughs> so explain. <laughs> it's like everything you hear in country, but I was the opposite. Um, so I, um, yeah, I mean, the weight was one thing. Um what happened is I, um, I just ended up like, it was all that it was, it was being on planes, it's all consuming, just, right? just, um, the club sandwiches, the alcohol, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, the, you know, conference planners and all the people that are inviting you to these things, you, you don't say no right. to the dinners and the special guests dinner that you're speaking at that night do the guest honor they paid for you to especially when they paid for you to to do that and to speak at it and to do all this stuff so and and then the food's so delicious so you're like oh my god this is good and you're overlooking an ocean and and every night is like that Mm -hmm. and so you're like oh my god this is so good and so um anyway fast forward uh one i flew home one night, this is after two years, and uh, Henry's 11, my youngest, um, and um, he he actually called me in to his room, and and by the hand he guided me into his room, and he sat me down on his on his bed, and he said, "Dad, um, I think that you're uh, getting too too big for your, where your health is, and you have." Uh, been given, uh, told that you have diabetes type two. And, um, and that was something that, uh, you know, a couple months before I was told by my doctor and I totally like blew my mind. I was like, Oh, how did I let this happen to me? And, um, and then he said, and, um, and you're never home and you're now missing like my games and you're missing like stuff at school and reality, you're, you're, check, not, man. you're not here. And, and then he said, and I don't think you're going to get to meet my 
children, your grandchildren one day. And um, this is your 11 year old. Yeah. And he said, so um, I just want to let you know that, you know, I really think that all this is coming is going on. And I hope that, um, you know, you can get healthy. Just like that. Yeah. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. I happen to know Henry and I have no doubt it happened exactly like that. Um, yeah. He's a pretty insightful, insightful guy. Yeah. He's a young man now. So we have this going on. We got kind of a reality check from our 11 year old about him being worried about you. And you basically just getting your backward country song kind of told told to your, to your face kind of thing. What's happening with the agency during this time? I mean, you're away for practically two years. So what's going on at the business? You know, how is that? I mean, you're, you're the, you and Courtney are very, very, you know, I guess you each play your roles. Everybody's got their, their roles. And now you've taken sort of a major role player out of the day to day. Not that you're not involved, but you're not there and not being there in an office full of people or, you know, in front of clients every day. It's going to certainly had some effect. Yeah. Maybe what's going on. It's a big effect. Um, the, um, the clients that we had at the time were pretty, pretty big. We, we uh, moved away from our small clients, local clients and grew into um, more uh, large enterprise, global clients, Cisco, MasterCard, um, IBM, Netflix, some really cool big mm-hmm. clients and enjoyed it, did some really neat stuff. And, um, and we, we, we won anything to do to Courtney it was Courtney's work and her creativity and all kinds of cool stuff. We won so many awards and did some really cool things. And, um, because of me following my, my Your passion, passion over here and what I still think I'm really good at and love to do on some level. I was also the rainmaker for the agency. Mm-hmm. Um, it, Courtney always says my job is to go out and get the meat and bring it in and throw it on the table. And then their job was to make the meat and turn it into something. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't, that's, I wasn't doing that anymore. And so, um, so it really had a slight hit on the agency. Um, it wasn't massive, but it was a, it was a big dent mm-hmm. on the agency. Um, most of what happened is I, I just lost, um, I just, I just got burned out. Mm-hmm. I just got massively burned out. I just, I, I just hit a wall. Yeah. And your, your kids saw it coming and you yeah. weren't. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. got burned out. I got burned out on marketing. I got burned out on, I, I, I didn't really feel like, um, like in marketing, in marketing, I wasn't seeing results directly. Which are measurable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I couldn't see that when we did something that it was having a massive dent mm-hmm. in IBM. And I don't mean that just on IBM. They're a great company. But I mean, I couldn't see that in a company. We'd see that in a very small way. Right. And I lost my passion for marketing for the time being. Mm-hmm. That's uh, easy to do. And I lost my passion for uh, having an effect on what I was doing. The human to human. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was all about this one thing and I couldn't affect the change that you wanted change to affect. I wanted, I got into it for, or at um, least the expectation that you had of yourself and of your, right. your efforts. Exactly. Yeah. And then here on the speaking side, I was speaking to, I don't know, 3,000, 5,000 and 10 at one point. And, but I wasn't, seeing the change and in any, like it was, it was a rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. Although I changed what I was speaking about a little bit, but it was again, the same thing. Sort of a dog and pony show at this point, right? I mean, you're kind of autopilot at this point, I would imagine. Yeah. And, but at a different level, because you have to show up and your game face has to be on. You got to bring your A game. Again, you're the, you're the, the the guest of the party, the honoree, and you got to be, you got to be ready to go. Yet you're coming back to these other things and you're feeling, I don't know, is it fair to say you're feeling like a failure? Not a failure as much as I was feeling like 
something was missing. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't, um, there was something missing. Yeah. Something, I wasn't living my purpose just to use something that's yeah. over, overused. Yeah, I don't know. I think everybody uh, has to have one, but yeah, I don't know that everybody understands what that really means. Yeah. I think I do. I, but, I do now. Right. I understand what that means now. Um, and when I look, look back, it was, it was, um, I had what I had to do and what I did is I, I had to go home. And so ironically, uh, Henry left me with that interesting bombshell of a great thing that he did. And ironically, I left the next, next day on an airplane cause I was already leaving. Right. And I cried on the airplane, just sobbed. I sorry for the guy that was sitting next to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I was in this place of like going through the motion of getting on stage, speaking, doing my thing. Having to put the game do, face on, do put, put it in a box. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just like went, I'm done. I just like somewhere in that trip, I, I just light switch went on. I go, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Came home the next day or two and walked in and said to court, um, done, not with us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're good. Yeah, cause she'd beat your ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're good. Uh, and she, she said, okay, um, so tell me what's going on. Yeah. I said, well, you, you know, we're gonna stay married, but everything else I'm done and I'm gonna stop speaking and I gotta find a way out of the agency. And she goes, me too, I'm burned out too. Wow. And so we took six months and off um, we transitioned ourselves out of mm -hmm. the agency and exited. And uh, I just start, started saying no to every every speaking opportunity I could. And just said no, which was like turning down. Um, it's like turning down. I mean, it's, it's like saying no to um, to you, an income. Right. And and you just, you're turning off your living. Was, the faucet just turns off. Right. Yeah. And maybe this either the stupidest or the smartest thing you're, you you do, but. Um, and, and the hardest thing I've realized is when you, you turn down speaking, the hardest thing to do is actually turn it back turn on. Turn it back on. Yeah. I didn't know that at the time. Cause, mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't hire you if the momentum is not there. Right. Sure. Um, you're not hot anymore. It's yeah. kind of like Hollywood, right? You know, you, you had, you're not, you're not that bright shining star. And if you turn down too much, they're going to, there's people lined up, you know, a hundred people deep to take that spot. And. And at a time when things are moving and evolving as fast as they are, particularly in the digital media space, I'm sure there were. So you're taking time off. Is there a, is there a point there where you mentioned, I know what my purpose is now. Did you discover it in that six month period? Um, what, what happened next after that in terms of turning things back on? Cause I know you did that. Yeah. That the six months isn't when it got turned off. It's the year after the six months that that happened. So six months was cruel, like hard mm -hmm. um, to offload everything. That Financially, emotionally. Yeah, that was hard. How's yeah. your health doing at this point? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, suffering. It was the worst of worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I was went to town on pastrami sandwiches. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're finding coping mechanisms. Yeah. Some people do it with certain things. Some yeah. people do it with pastrami sandwiches. And tequila. Yeah. And, te <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so because we had 18 years of unra unraveling to do mm -hmm. and, um, and finances and we took a, a hit and went, went um, and had to redo and, and, beg, borrow, steal right. to get out of everything, rents and all kinds of stuff. So uh, for the office and we had 6,000 square feet of office space, and you know, how it's, it's, it's just crazy. A so, lot of liability there at that point. Right? Yeah. yeah. To just so, walk away, maybe we're done. Yeah. Often. You want to be done, but you're not really done. Like you, you're done with this part, which really means you're just, you're at the be beginning of the end, <laughs> which that end could go for on for a long, long time. And so it goes on for like another year. Right. Yeah, okay. Wouldn't it be nice just to Peter Pan your way out of things and think about that all the time. I have, to, I have to be honest that, you know, I was, I was reflecting with CC. We had some time to kind of come up for some air a little bit ago. And, you know, after all the crazy things we've been through in this last year, as, as everybody has been, uh, particularly those of business and looking back, 
who was just kind of thinking, man, it was so much, so much easier, so much simpler where we started, which was literally in 600 square feet. And now we're in 6,000 square feet. And it's not that we're not thankful for where we're at and, and count our blessings. It was just, man, you know, mm-hmm. make a bigger business, Scott. It'll be better, right? You'll make more money. You'll impact more people. There'll be, it'll be so much fun. And then you look back and you go, Oh, maybe it wasn't so bad. You know, maybe it wasn't so bad. So, so health is suffering. We're trying to get our our financial shit together, right? We're 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 kind of trying to figure out what the next steps are going to be. You and Courtney are now kind of solo, no employees, no agency, no nothing. You're literally having to start again from scratch. Uh, do you do this together? Um, I mean, and I don't mean that from a relationship perspective. I mean this from like a from a work perspective. Do you do this together? You kind of decide. I want to do something here and she wants to do something there and you go separate ways or how'd that work out? Yeah, well, we, first we had to discover what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. We we really had no idea. Um, I, 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 I said I'm, I'm, I'm done without knowing what's next, what's next, which is so unlike me. My whole life I was, a, I was a planner. I knew how I was going to make money. I knew how much I wanted to make. I knew I was going to get there. I knew how fast I was going to do it. And this was not me. This was the different me. And same thing for Court. She was the same kind of person. So the, for the both of us to do what we just did was so radically different to do it that way. Uh, first thing I had to do was just take control of my health. Mm-hmm. That is it. I had to do that. Um, after that six months, I, I, I went into hibernation for a year. Um, and, and I just hibernated and I didn't even focus on my health. I just actually focused on just chilling out, Mm -hmm. not like couch potato, chill out, just being, uh, being right. (laughs) Being, just trying to regulate the stimulus, just being and just being okay present and present Mm -hmm. and meeting up with friends and just reconnecting with life and not going fast and learning yeah learning how to learning how to live without having it being pushed all the time having to be okay not doing anything right mentally yeah physically being okay not having a calendar you know i i calendar so deep uh-huh. you know you never see the bottom you know not having the emails pouring through at lightning speed, not having the text messages, not feeling like you have to respond. I can tell you that that gave me great anxiety when I started doing that. It it really, I just did not know what to do with myself. It was very, very tough to tune it all back. Um, It wasn't very hard to turn it back on for me in that sense, but God, like the phone isn't ringing 24 seven. I don't have to be here at a certain time. I now have more control, which I really did the whole time, but I let the other thing control me. So far, so so dialing it back and kind of figuring out, okay, I am in control. I need to own this. I need to set some boundaries. And uh, so it sounds like for you, the first mm-hmm. thing is, is like, let's just chill. Let's just not do anything and we'll start there. That's right. And how that work. Yeah. Oh my God, it was so cool. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have to sell anybody anything. I didn't have to um, think about what I was gonna you know, try and do, I didn't have, I didn't, I had a lot of, it was carrying a lot of debt and somehow everything worked out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, let's see what happens next. And, and, um, then around that time, Courtney got a, an offer to come work for a company as, um, an outsourced, uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. She's like a cat. She just like lands on her feet. Me, yeah. Some something just always comes up, and and so so th- it's this organization that is the largest coaches training company in the world for um, for coaching um, for you know, all kinds of coaching, like coaches that you know help people perform and improve in life and business. And um, so she goes there and she's starting to consult them. They've been a past client of Pure Matter, um, and we we also knew the co president. And she, um, she does so well, which surprised, not surprised. And, um, then something happened to one of the marketing people that was leading the thing and she'd done so well for like six months. They said, well, you just lead us globally for marketing. And then 
Um, I'm like, you can't not do that. And right. she steps up and then for, you know, I'm, I'm like, their content and their stuff is so good, like their actual product. Mm. And so they were friends and family thing. And so I signed up for it and I stepped into one of their rooms and took the training. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. These are my people. Where have you been my whole life? Like their, their, their training is really powerful. Um, and I went through the whole program. She and I went through their whole leadership program. And it's like a 10 month intensive program for uh, leadership training. And I met incredible people. And, and, um, and then I started thinking after we went through all that, what if I combine this with my marketing? Right. Uh, again, I'm not burned out on marketing. I'm burned out on the type of marketing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And if I combine the two with coaching and marketing and teach people on how to grow themselves and start to impact people individually mm -hmm. instead of companies. Where you can see an impact I and can you can measure it. the impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to become whole again. I can, now I can see and fulfill my true purpose and that's really going to be cool. So interesting how the H2H comes back around and yeah. you know, working with big companies that are essentially entities that really aren't people. Well, yeah. I got people that run them right yep. back to the individual one-on-one -on -one and back to your roots, right? Building websites. Yeah. I mean, it's like you guys here are working with individuals and seeing them become healthy again and what, what they can do. And once I started seeing progress in people that really start, started to spark what I could do then, um, from a health standpoint immediately, mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a big, um, epiphany right in the middle of that leadership piece. Um, when I was going through the training and I was starting to see that impact I was having on people. And that's when my health piece picked up, uh, two years ago. And, um, when I could see the impact I could have on people and how that was, how, how I started to shed all the, the stuff from those past previous three years of from pure matter and the travel. And I gave myself the time to really, you know, be, um, then all of a sudden I started to see how I could you know, potentially now lose, lose weight. And it w hadn't had everything to do with my mindset. Mindset, right. That was all mindset. So what do you start doing physically? Was it hard? Physically, nothing. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I didn't. Like in terms of exercise, it's not like you're out there going uh, to the gym five days a week and running three miles three times a week or anything like that. No. It was really about tuning down the brain and getting a handle on things there. And then, yeah, my problem was food. Mm -hmm. It's always been food. I think we're all uh, challenged at some level there. That's a human thing. Yeah. 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 No, I knew, I knew, I know how to work out and I know how to do the, um, I know how to get into a gym and I know how to do all that stuff with your guidance. Um, you know, getting into a gym and, um, it's not rocket and, science and, and <laughs> calling you up and saying, Hey, I'm going to come work out and do that kind of stuff as I've done over the years. That's that, that's something I know when it's time, I need to go do that. Mm -hmm. My issue, uh, and I know that that will help me lose weight, but I also know that that will, when I stop, the weight will come back on. Right. Why? Because I'm not good at the eating part. Right. And so what I had to do is I had to learn to eat better. And so I just learned to eat better. And I know this, you know this, but I didn't know this. If you just eat less, you weigh less. <laughs> <laughs> That's a simple formula. Yeah. So I ate less and I ate better and I learned to eat better. And that now as of like two days ago, I lost 70 pounds. That's incredible. Yeah, congratulations. You look fantastic, man. And I have to tell you, because I, I have watched this transformation happen, you know, from the, the highs to the lows. And I mean that in the, in the good sense, the high weights and the low weights. And you can see it in your face. I mean, it, it, it's in your eyes, you know, like you're just, you know, there's vibrancy there mm -hmm. versus before, you know, maybe not so much. So congratulations, man, on making it, making it this far. Thank you. Yeah. So let's get in. So that kind of brings us to the present, right? So we're, like you said, as of yesterday, you're down 75, 70, 70, yeah. 70 pounds. So, so now you're, now you're coaching, right? You're, 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 you're coaching. How much speaking is happening? I mean, given given where we're at right now versus the coaching? Uh, speaking is probably about five to 10%. Yeah. Uh, and that's more, um, part of that, part of that was choice and part of that is where we are sure. uh, physically. Yeah, we, we, we're still locked down here in California and yeah. travels, you know. It's, for, it's all virtual now. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. So talk, to, who, who are your clients now? Who are you working with? So you, you said, look, I started, started to see 
my ability to impact people that mm-hmm. was measurable and they were starting to change and be successful. And who are your clients now? Where are they coming from? Who are they? My, my clients, ironically, it ended up, uh, a lot of them ended up being marketers that are getting burned out. Mm-hmm. Surprise. It, no, not at all. <laughs> that industry just chews people up it and can. kicks them out. So, um, I get a lot of marketers that, that also want to do what I did. So are they getting, are they already burnt out? They're, they're either on their way or, or and you're, are you helping them to realize yeah. that and make a change? Not realize, but make the transition. Okay. Um, how do I get out? Uh, I have people that are also already out, but they, they're, they're looking for how do I then find my next thing. I have a lot of people that are also coaches mm-hmm. that they know how to coach. They've never been taught how to run a grow coaching a business, business mm-hmm. and market a business. And then I have a lot of entrepreneurs and executives that also, um, they don't know also, or are, aren't, uh, they don't have the resources available to then look at how do I grow my personal brand? How do I get up on stage and do what he did, what I did, yeah. uh, right. Or build the book, grow the, grow the personal brand. I've, I've, I've risen inside of a company, but mm-hmm. what, how do I grow this? So the real question or the, the challenge is, is how do I, how do I scale the H2H while also building a business? Right. Is that fair? Yeah. That's exactly right. But how do you do it? Um, well, you gotta pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, um, nothing secret. Um, there's, um, there's a the business side, and then there's the kind of high level side. Mm-hmm. I'll answer both. the The high level side first. There's, um, there's simple pillars that you should just follow. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll ask you some questions um, that'll help anybody that's listening to follow along. I love it. Okay. So there's three pillars, simplicity, empathy, and imperfection. So if every person followed this and built this into their business or into themselves and instilled this into their personal brand, they would succeed. So simplicity, we talked about this years ago. Mm -hmm. So the in and out burger. Oh, I love this analogy. So simplicity, who is your favorite brand or a brand that comes up? Maybe I just gave you the answer, but (laughs) simplicity who comes up with the most simplistic brand that you can think of. Yeah. There's, there's in in terms of simplicity and the one that, the one that we've, we've always used and I still use to this day, Brian, so I'm going to use it. Um, whether you preloaded it or not, I would have said this and I got this from you and that's in and out burger. Yeah. Right. And there's three things on the menu. Right. That you get when you go there and everybody knows that. Right. Yeah. And it's super easy to explain. It's very visual. Yeah. There's no, it, it's not complicated. It's right. It's a burger and maybe it has cheese on it and maybe it doesn't, or maybe it has two patties or maybe it doesn't. Yeah. It's still burgers. Yeah. And it has fries and that's what you get. Doesn't it kill you when you're behind somebody in a line and you get up to the front right behind them and they're at the cashier and what they, the hell is taking so long? and they haven't decided yet. What the hell like, is taking so long? There's three things three th- on the menu. It's either a double, double or a single. And do you want cheese or not? One, Done. two or three. Done. How did you get out of bed and get here today? <laughs> if you can't make that decision, you know, they shouldn't deserve a burger. I, and part of me agrees with you, Brian. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if we have to complicate things that much, then I, I start, I don't know. I start to get a little emotional in the background. You know? <laughs> like, then I'll, do you coach them or do you? No, they, that's a, that's a hell no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, I'm too expensive. Right. <laughs> so, um, the number two is, um, empathy. Yeah. So what brand embraces empathy for their customer? Gosh, I mean, one one that comes out right now. Mm. If I'm being biased, I'd say I'd say Red Dot Fitness. Cool. Yeah. In what way? I think it's it's the ability to kind of listen to somebody and understand what their needs are, uh, and dig down, not just at the surface level, but understand really, really deeply. What is it? Why is it that you're here? What is it that you're looking for? And why is that important to you? Um, and then get a 
a strong sense of awareness beyond that of how they got here, what's the history look like, mm. and where do they want to go? And do those, is that a reality? You mm. know, is it, do their, do the things match up? And then the empathy comes in with, I want to help you here, and I'm going to do that as not do it for you, but I'm going to be here to help you every step of the way that I can. I'm going to take my, this is my role, and this is your role, and uh, as long as we're on the same page there and we're communicating mm. on the level that we just communicated and we built trust yeah. and we built a, we built a, um, <clears throat> yeah, we built a relationship to where we, we have strong communication skills. The empathy's easy. Mm. Not for everybody. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. The fact that you uh, just explained it the way you did is awesome and not for everybody. That's a hard one. Yeah, I get most. it. Yeah. Um, I think people actually, I think it's hard for people to kind of accept that too, for a customer or for, or for a client that comes in, you know, there's skepticism. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of, wait, 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 what's yeah. going on here? You know, uh, what's the catch? Or you're trying to sell me something and I'm, where's the, the shoe going to drop here and, and so forth. And it's no, no, really, it's just what it is. Empathy is intimacy. And when you get intimacy, there's, you're right, there's trust. And intimacy is into me, you see. And getting somebody to do that, to cross that line is hard for people to do. It's hard to get that, and to train people to do that into that mindset, to get that, to cross that threshold. For a company to do that is so powerful. So I, uh, getting that that deep is, is, is one of the most brilliant things that you could have done with your business. It's, it's risky for a business to do, though, too. It very much is. So not only does the, does the leader or your client have to understand that they need, well, in your case, your, your coach that you're trying to coach to be empathetic. If you don't know what that is, if you haven't experienced it, how are you going to practice it? Yeah, you have to practice it through being vulnerable right. and through sharing of yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you know, that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, next one's imperfection. Mm -hmm. Who embraces... And th so there's no such thing as perfect. Right. Uh, if there was, we wouldn't be sitting here talking because we'd have all the answers. So who embraces imperfection? Definitely not the NFL. So we know they're out. So who embraces imperfection? I think, um, interestingly, my take, I, I like Elon Musk and, and, uh, and Tesla for this mm. because of Elon and his ability to go, hmm, well, that's new information. And we'll, we'll fix that or we'll make it better. And their product mm. shows that consistently. I'm, I'm not a huge fan. I don't, I don't drive a Tesla. I drive a Chevy. Mm. Um, but uh, I, think, I think they actually do a pretty good job with that. I don't know, who would you say? Well, that's a good one. I, I, like, I like Tesla. Um, I, I, gave, I, gave, I don't drive a car anymore. I gave mine back. I'm all about simplicity, right? Um, so uh, Dove. I think is a good one. Okay, yeah. Um, just, you know, embracing imperfection. Their campaign about gotcha. imperfection, I think, is a brilliant campaign. Um, the way that they did the um, uh, the uh, uh, cultural campaign. Um, but, yeah, no, I agree. I agree with Tesla. I think there's a lot of them. I think um, on, um, you know, the um, embracing um, the... Um, all, all, all of them, there's a lot of different companies, there's a lot of different people too, as you look at each one. When you look at a personal brand, you can, you can apply each of these to people and companies, which is the point. Right. And hopefully as people are listening along, they're, they're thinking about this too, about how people might be perceiving them in each of this as they're looking at their brand, their website, their emails, the way that they're they're communicating the way that they're showing up, the right. way that they're pricing, the right way that they're doing things. So this is in answer to your question. This is how you do it. And, and um, when you start to think about a company out there that has all three, all three, empathy, imperfection and simplicity. I'm not going to throw you that one because that's really hard. I wouldn't even know it. It's it rarely it's a unicorn but it's the highest that we can achieve. Mm -hmm. And that's what we should be that's shooting what we're, for. That's what we're driving for. That's what we should be shooting for. It's so, it's so interesting, because if we go back even 10 years and we talk about the simplicity or the empathy piece and the, 
human to human connection that you have to have, whether you're the CEO of a massive corporation like Tesla or Apple or whatever else, uh, and or you know the person that's coaching the one on one coaching with the client, it's so different than it was ten years ago. But I, I remember it was very important to me when when I founded Red Dot that it wasn't about Scott, it wasn't about me. It, 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 I wanted it to be about the company uh, or the, the the community, and the community was made up of the people. And yes, I was part of that, but it wasn't going to be about me. And I didn't want it to be, I wanted it to take on a life of its own. And because I felt like you could scale that versus scaling me. And I knew that kind of early on. And back then it didn't, it didn't really, it wasn't re- super important that people knew who the owner of the company was, who the CEO of the company was. They just wanted the things that you've sort of outlined, whether they realized that or not at the time. But now now it's so different now people want and need to know who they're buying their products and their services from and they're making decisions based on that person over the product or the service um and it more than ever you know more than ever now so going back to your room full of you know jaws on the chest when you're talking about oh my god i've got to answer for everything um CEOs are probably quick, you know, quaking in their boots a little bit, but some of them going, yeah, we're doing our thing. We'll be fine. The people that you're working with now, I guess where I'm going with this is the people that you're working with now, are they kind of coming from the old school and never really had to be that individual that had to do that? They served a purpose. They were a cog in the wheel. Uh, and now having to come out of it going, now you are the machine and you need to figure out all these different pieces. And I guess what I'm saying is, is are these are these people, have they been through the game for a long, long time and are trying to adjust somehow to coming out the other end? Or are these new, new people to the game that are just struggling to kind of figure it out? I would say that most people aren't comfortable with stepping up and out. Um, it's not old school, it's new, it's, it's always been there that most aren't comfortable with stepping up on stage Mm -hmm. and, and sharing their story and their voice. Um, I, I see it all the time and, and that's because most don't know their story and they don't know the story to to tell and share. Um, that's what I end up working with most of them on. What's my story. And I think it's a, it's a bit of, um, imposter syndrome. Yeah, I was just going to go there. And how, what do we, What am I sharing? Why would somebody be interested why in what I have to share? Right. Um, why, how would I get on stage? Why would somebody want to be, uh, it's that saboteur that pops up and it's the loudest voice in everybody's head that pops forward when you go to say, oh, I want to, I want to go start a business. I want to go start a product. I want to go start a, a coaching business on whatever it is. And, and then all of a sudden it's that one saboteur that comes forward and says, no, you can't do that. And um, that's where I usually start working on that saboteur with them. And, and first and foremost, just start, you know, getting the saboteur to take a seat and quieting the voice and then pulling forward the, the, the right team. Um, not that I want them to have, a, you know, um, many voices in their head and start, you know, going to a different place. But we want to pull the, the, the positivity out of that and work on that. And then once they have that as a skill, then we can create, um, create from there the right mindset. Everything's mindset. Right. Mindset, mindset, mindset. Once we can create from there, same thing as your business, I would imagine. I make up in my head everything, everything on, on what we're working for is mindset. So if we can start doing that, then from there, um, to get back to your original question, um, it's, it's really a kind of a formulaic process. Right. Um, there's, there's about six different touch points, uh, six different things that we need okay. to go through to get them there. You actually mentioned one of them. Um, and I'll, I'll get there. The first one is mindset. The second one is building on, um, their personal brand, which is what is your story? The third one is what is your niche? And I'm a sub nicher. Like what's be your like, niche of your niche? What's your niche of your niche of your niche of your niche? Mm-hmm. Like, who is it? Um, 
that doesn't mean you can't expand later. Mm -hmm. But the reason that most people don't niche down is because they like to boil the ocean because they, they think, sorry, mm -hmm. they think that it's easier to go for everybody and then um, and then they'll have a much better right. way of attracting people. And it Cast couldn't, the wider be, net. couldn't be opposite. It's hard. Right. More opposite than that. Right. They'll actually attract a much uh, smaller. smaller, intimate, more intimate group of people if they can sub niche. Um, and then the next one is uh, creating a um, um, create, creating a, um, uh, a a way of attracting people in through a dialogue, which I call the HH sales script, which will allow allow them to have a conversation that mm -hmm. actually works. Right. And so I, I it would take us another two hours to sure. actually talk it through. But there's a a way of actually. Is a dialogue creating a conversation, right. some human to human conversation. Like you actually have to talk to people. I know it sounds hard, but do it. Like yeah. these things are not just email systems. These phones are phones. So get on them and talk. Right. Do it. Um, and so write down 20 names, call them, get on the phone. Don't expect anything in return and just talk to people and ask them if you can talk to them for like 90 minutes and give them a lot of value and and give and watch what happens after 20, 20 phone calls. I guarantee you something's going to happen and see what happens. Right. I guarantee something with no gonna expectation, happen. no just, expectation. Just go in and give, go and do it. Have an impact. Yeah. Attempt to have an impact with no expectation. See what happens. I'll leave it there. All right. Next step is creating community. That's the one I heard you say. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's communities are how I grew my business. Um, you, you, you had mentioned that too. And I think community is the key to everything. Um, and you make communities, you build communities. I, I, I'm in love with Facebook communities. I think Facebook communities for now, um, and I can move a community, you know, from here to One there, platform to, to the anywhere next. Yeah. I, they'll follow wherever the community is going. But right now you can grow a community and, and have, um, a community build itself, co-create a community and, and, and have business pouring in through the right community. And so I teach people how to do that. And you can run out and do a free community today. So it's great. Um, and then the, the next one is just creating momentum. Um, what do you do with all this once you have it? You gotta do something with it. You gotta document it, yep. you gotta capture the case studies, you gotta you know, get referrals and do all this stuff with it. So it's so that you don't have to constantly chase it. You it's know, create life too. balance. And yep. You don't wanna, continue to put weight on. You got to do it in a way that you're going to have more hours with your children and, and um, build, build things on top of it. So, you know, what, what does that all look like after this? I guess the, the, the question I would have is for people that have, well, we're, let me back up. I'm going to kind of come at it from a different direction. With all the platforms that are out there, there's a lot of coaches, right? M myself included, you know, my, my, my team included here. A lot of coaches that have systems, right? They have uh, formulas, they have structures, and for them it works, you know, at some level. And then you see people selling those, you know, or attempting to sell those through social media and um, on, on all the different platforms. And that's, that's the hobby because it's the easiest one. It's, it's very low barrier of entry. It's easy to do. And anybody right now with a cell phone and a, you know, and a credit card can run ads and things like that. It's becoming a little bit more difficult to get your message out there. But you work with anybody that's just messed it all up and they're trying to recover and come out the other end. And what I mean by that is they've taken your, your, your pillars and they messed them up. They tried to be empathetic and they weren't. They tried to be simple or sold simplicity, but it wasn't. And the they've created a persona or they've created a sort of an entity behind a persona that isn't them. Um, and they've sort of manufactured it. You work with anybody like that? And if so, how do they, how do they change the game? How do they get themselves out of that trap that they put themselves in, put themselves in that the, the, the only way to come out of it is to be authentic and honest and so forth. Have you, have you experienced that? Yes. So I've earlier in my coaching, I, we agreed to stop working together early on. 
Um, Who's we? We meaning me and the client. Okay, gotcha. Um, because we could see early on that this wasn't going to work. Oh, in this particular case. Um, and so, um, yeah. Um, and but that's that's that I I feel like that was also on me because I didn't uh, early on I didn't have a way of determining and establishing if the if the client was ready for me. Now I do. How do you do that? Yeah. Now I do. Now I know exactly how to do that, and I don't have that problem anymore. Right. Um, I can do that, and that's why I do a ninety minute, um, extremely thorough. Um, and in fact, I'm I'm more looking for no mm -hmm. now than a yes. Like kind of trying to sell them out of it. I'm I want I want to see if I I want to I want to make sure that they're really 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 ready for me because the the thing is is if they're not a ten, I don't want them. Um, because I'm, I'm ready to go. And if they're not a 10, then we're not going to work yeah, out. You can't want it more than they do. No. You can't be working harder than they're going to work. Yeah. I don't, if they're stuck, that's not the question. If they want to get to where they want to be and that's a 10, that's what I want to care about. And a lot of coaches, I think, fall into that trap. You know, they're, they're making a transition or they've decided they're finally going to go all in. This isn't just a side gig or a side hustle anymore. I'm, I'm going to do this. You know, they kind of have that, that, little Rolodex of clients and it's little, it's not big. And they know if they want to take it to the next level, they're going to have to give up something to do that. And then they do it out of like desperation. They take on clients that they don't want that aren't really set up to be successful. Not because the coach isn't doing the things that the coach needs to do, but because it was very obvious at some level up front that the, the client wasn't going to do the work. And it just, it's just, it's an energy suck and you start to resent things, right? As a, as a, as a, as a coach, you don't want to meet with this person. You're just giving them information with no empathy with no, cause it, eventually they just wear you out of that. They'll just, they'll just wear you out. What's your advice to coaches that are out there that are maybe stuck in that situation right now that have, you know, 15 clients and five of them, they know these aren't the right clients for them. And they're having a tough time figuring out how am I going to get out of this situation? I hate this, right? I, I do not like this. What do you do? Um, well, you're, um, you have a choice. You're at a choice point. You got, do you want to, you're, you're, you're in a, you're in the rat, the, what is it? The rat maze or, um, the, yeah, the little hamster wheel, hamster of, wheel, yeah. whatever, whatever you want to call it. And you're never going to get out of it if you don't, cut them off right. and, and, and just jump. You got to jump. You got to take action. You got to jump. So first things first, you got to, you got to cut, you got to cut them. Number two, is it worth $500 of your time to take on these clients that are not going to be worth your time per client when you could be making $2,500 per client? Um, and that's not to say that every client's just about money, but is it in the long run going to benefit you from a health standpoint, from a time standpoint, from a um, growth standpoint? From, you only have X amount of hours a week. You're trading time. So you're trading time on money and you can help people more. Let's say that you take on 10 clients and you can help them from a Jerry Maguire standpoint and you can really help those 10 clients. Or you wanna serve 100 clients a month for 500 bucks a piece. How, which one do you wanna choose and how are you gonna really help people? And which client do you, if I were your client, I want the guy that is carrying 10 clients, not the one that has 100. It's that simple. I can't put it any other way. Yeah, it's, t it's a tough pill to swallow. And I think people get so caught up in the fear. And I watched this happen with, with good coaches, good coaches, both in the business sense and uh, the fitness, health and wellness sense. They forget what got them there in the first place, which was, and then when they realize that, they remember how hard it was. There's a lot of work. Um, at some point along the way, you probably got lazy, which is how you wound up with these clients that you don't want anyway. And it's tough to maybe kind of take a look at the mirror and go, you know, I, I took the easy route with this person and this is where it's left me. And, yeah. and in order to get out of this, fuck, 
first off, fuck, I got to have this conversation with this person. I got to fire them, right? That's really uncomfortable and awkward. Um, how's that going to look? What's that going to do to my community? Will that trickle down, you know, so forth? Um, secondly, then I'm going to have to find somebody to replace that, that person, which means, man, now I got to go back to this 20 phone call thing again. Like, it feels like I'm starting all over again. And they don't, yeah, you got to do the freaking work. You, nobody's going to do it for you. you. You have to do it. So I think you're going to say something there. I mean, yeah. you, you triggered something in me. And, and I'm this, you, as you can tell, it really, um, there's no other way around it. You got you want to, you want a business, you got to work. Right. That's just, that's, that's that. But the other thing is that um, every, there isn't a person out there that hasn't spent money on something that got zero, zero result, return. Right. Not one human guaranteed, guaranteed. I've spent at least a half, I don't know, 200,000. I hate to say it, but this is why my wife is really frustrated with me because <laughs> yeah, I've spent a lot of money on <laughs> shit. I'm looking around the studio right now. They're like, yeah, I know she's, if she was here, she would be like, well, yeah, that's the least. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I, um, and I, um, I know that and that's where my empathy comes from. And that's why I can charge the prices I do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I do. And that's why I take little amount of clients, a low amount of clients, because I know that I'm going to charge you a lot. Um, I also know that I, if I take um, fewer clients, you're gonna get all of me. Right. Um, and I know you're gonna be successful if you're coming in at a level 10. Um, you may be lower in other areas because that's why you're, you're hiring me. But at a 10 of what you want and truly desire, um, and I know you paid other people and didn't get it. I almost want that. I want that. You want them to have had the bad experience or the failure. I, I, know, I know it because every human's had it. Right. And, and, um, and I feel it. I feel it. I know, and I know, I don't, I'm going to be the last time you had that. And you, you know what that feels like because you've done that. I've been there. Right. You've, you've thrown the money down. I, I'm, I'm empathetic towards that. Right. You're not going to get that here. And I'm going to make that clear every time. Right. And if I can't see that in that 90 minutes that we can't do that, I'm going to say no. Not the right client for you. Because that's, um, that's, that's got to be that way. We got to do that as, as professionals, as coaches. Yeah. So you're trading your time but you're also the time that you're bringing to the table for that money is the experiences that you've had, the investments that you've made, and you're not willing to bargain. You're all, you're not willing to compromise. Like this is what I know works. Um, and I only take a select few clients because I know that it works and I, the ones that I want to work with. And too often we find people trying to bargain and price shop for the answer to their problem. And the answer to that problem will continue to exist as long as you're putting that as the priority and not even maybe investing the 90 minutes of free time, right? That Brian may be giving you or, you know, a coach may be giving you to talk through what your issues to find out if we really should be working together. You know, um, they want an answer. They want a quick pill and they, mm. you know, they want the, they want the easy button and they want it now. Oh, I love the price conversation. Um, if you're not comfortable talking about money, um, get comfortable. Money is like my favorite topic. Yeah, especially price. if you're so, trying to build a business for crying out if loud. If you can't talk money, you, you, you got to get comfortable talking money. Um, number two is you should just have very few prices. And, right. and you, you're not selling hourly. If you're selling hourly, you're a commodity. You're selling value. Right. The value of the outcome. What are the outcomes that you're selling? List them, walk over to a whiteboard and have you and your team write down all the outcomes that you're selling. And the moment that they ask you what your price is, your price is your value, your value are your outcomes. If you don't know your outcomes of what it is that they're trying to achieve, you're in the wrong business. I think the interesting part about this too is people want to be sold. They do. They might not necessarily understand that, but they want to go through a 
good sales process. To them, they might not be able to articulate that to you, but they want to hear those things. They want to know the logic behind it. They want to know how it relates specifically to them. And you just mentioned, well, let's just write them down. Let's do the old Ben Franklin. You know, here's the pros, here's the cons, and here's what you get, here's what you don't get. Gives you an opportunity to set boundaries up front. Here's what this is. Here's what it isn't. Here's your job, your role. Here's my role. And the at the end of the day, it's, it's a natural part of this process because that is what we're doing at the end of the day, which is doing business. And if you've got a coach, as you've said, who's had a hard time having that conversation or gets defensive or, well, I don't know, sweaty palms and, you know, is nervous and, you know, stumbling over their words and is only, is just fix it. It has, you know, sticker shock at looking at that without looking at the bigger picture. Um, big problem. And you're, you know, that's going to be a big problem. And you've said that, and that will not be successful in business. And I think you got sort of a duty at that point to let them know without, you know, politely and, and professionally, this is going to be a challenge for you. And I would encourage you to really look hard at this and think hard and deep about this and maybe get some coaching specific to this before you go to the next steps. Don't hire another coach to help you build your business until you've handled this piece first. It's sort of um, in, in this world, it would be like you want me to help you with your health and wellness. And when we look at the different aspects of that, um, there are many, there, there are many, and, and we break them into pillars and, and, you know, kind of talk about the triangle of awareness and what you're trying to achieve and why, and those kind of things. But wait, we're going to talk about your diet. You want to talk about nutrition. You want me to tell you what to eat, but you don't want to manage your caloric bank account. Does that make any sense whatsoever? But, and then we have this little conversation. Then we talk about the price and how much it costs. And you want to talk about the money and the price as it relates to your bank account. So you're highly aware and you'll manage those numbers and that, that data and that's those specifics all day long. But talking about you having to do the work to manage this caloric and budget, right? Let's just call it that. Um, your macro budget, you know, macronutrient budget and so forth that all of a sudden becomes off limits. It's, it, it's gonna, you're, you have an aversion to it. It's a dirty, dirty topic to even, this is not, this is going nowhere. And mm -hmm. you will continue to be unhappy and you will continue to not get the results that you said you've, or you articulated you want. And I can't help you. You know, the first thing that I say to someone, actually the thing that I say to them near the tail end of, are we a fit? Uh, this is kind of getting to the no um, answer of like, are we going to work together? Yeah. Are you coachable? Yes or no. Are you resourceful? And have you spent money on other things that didn't work out? If they don't say the right answer to all three, this isn't going to work. To your, to your answer, if they aren't going to answer the question of the caloric intake and being able to do that kind of stuff. They don't belong here. They can't, right? Because this is part of our program. This is what we're going to do. It is what it is. It's the formula. It's formula. Right. It's how we work. Yeah, if you want to hear somebody else give you the answer that you want to hear, then you should go pay for that. Go. Um, yeah. Um, and that's a scary thing for a business owner, specifically a new coach or somebody, again, that's having to make that transition from that 15 to 10 clients because they got to offload the five that suck is having that telling a potential client no. But that's the problem. That's what, that's how you got into this situation in the first place. So, but it, it is scary. And I get that people, you know, they've, they've, they're going to have to, it's again, it's very similar in health and, and fitness. And at some point you're, you're going to have to realize that the behaviors that you're engaging in are 1000% responsible for the results that you get. And you have to do the work. I think it's interesting in a day and age too, where it's so easy to get information and people want it now and they can get it now that instant gratification, how many excuses, how many things they'll do to not have to do the work to still try to get to the end result. And they'll keep doing it. Mm. They'll keep doing those. It's insanity, right? You keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result and then being upset or bitter about it, right? And then when somebody asks you to, 
you seek out maybe some help and they tell you what the price is, there's an immediate, you know, wall of resistance to it. it blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, you you knew me, well, my pretty much my whole life, and you've seen me blow up and blow d- go down, right. and blow up and go down, and blow up and go down, and blow up, and um, and it's because of that, you know, I eat a lot and then lose the weight and eat a lot, lose the weight, black and white, black and white, and that's that's who I who I know. That's like also from the family I'm from, and like I've learned that, and that was a behavior I had to correct the behavior. And also I learned um, a lot about myself in the last five years and what made that happen and that I had to follow, uh, I had to follow one thing. And it's this one thing that actually like changed, I think it was, I'd say even my life. And that's that I had to get a team around me. And it was just those three people that I had to trust. And it was um, my wife, my my uh, di- diabetes doctor mm-hmm. and um, and a, and a health person, a, a food counselor, mm-hmm. and those were my three. That was your answer. And and I didn't, because God knows if you post on Facebook, everybody's a health. Um, they they know everything. It's obnoxious, isn't it? Oh my God! And you mm-hmm. post on Instagram, and everybody knows every answer. Oh, and, and how, how you dare you disagree? That, yeah. If you tell people this is how I'm doing it, they'll tell you exactly why you're not doing it right. And oh, yeah. if you tell people like I lost ten pounds, I'm going to lose another ten, they'll tell you why that won't work. And if you tell people like, um, and if you all of a sudden stop losing weight and you're wondering why, they'll tell you all of the answers for why you're not doing that. And and it's at those points over my whole life that I would I would screw up and I would bounce back Mm -hmm. and um, and it's all for those reasons so then once I got my team in place and I only listened to those three cancel the noise yeah that's when it changed when does cancel culture start to turn to that Mm -hmm. (laughs) we just cancel out all this garbage you know and all the all the things it's uh it's interesting when you say team because here's a coach, here's a successful business person, and here's here's somebody that's trying to find balance and making the investments, and you, you need a team. You, I, I'd be hard pressed, you talked about humans um, making investments and getting zero return you know, on the investment. I do not know a single person that's been successful in health, wealth, relationships, that it did it all by themselves. I, I know we like to think that, yeah, I've, I did this, I rose to the top. Yes, you had to put in the work, but you didn't do it by yourself. No, nobody does. No, you can't. So what's the, it, it, you have to carefully choose who's on your team and you know, you need to know when it's not a right fit. Even after sometimes you may have made a mis- maybe, maybe you made a mistake. Oh, well, that didn't work out. And this is, this is a business relationship. So I'm gonna take my business elsewhere. And as a business person, you have to be okay with that sometimes, you know, and just know, it. all right, it didn't work out. Good luck to you. Uh, I'll be here if I can help you in any way in the future and have a nice life. Such a great way to be. And, and um, it's, it's important to just rip the Band-Aid off. Yeah. Don't just keep doing it. I think that's the lesson there, you know. Just make a change. Take action. Yeah. Stop making excuses. Stop bargaining. Right. Stop putting distractions out there. Yeah. Just fucking do it. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, be kind to yourself. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up about it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You'll be better off in the end. Mm-hmm. There's no, that's, that's completely unnecessary. I see a lot of that too. A lot of the self deprecation. I think it comes along with the imposter syndrome thing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, why do people want to listen to me? I'm not that interesting. You know, I'm not that smart. Right. Uh, and yeah, maybe you're not to some people. Yeah. Who fucking cares? Like, so you're not to those people, mm-hmm. but there's other people, you know, and you never know who, who you're going to have. We're just having a conversation with somebody the other day about, you never know who you're talking to, right? And you never know what kind of an impact you're going to have. So you do the right thing for sake of, sake of doing the right thing. And, you know, if that means firing a client, fire a client. You know? Yeah. Oh, I make a point of firing a client at least once every uh, just, <laughs> just to keep every six keep months. Good yeah. measure. <laughs> no, really. And um, at Pure Matter, we used to do more. We fire a client. Um, 
it was actually healthy. Yeah, we're not, we're, we're done. Yeah, it yeah. was it was healthy. Because mm -hmm. there, there's usually uh, somebody who's draining, it drains your, your bottom line. Um, it's, and so it was a, a much healthier way of being. And, it, and, and there's always something that's, that's dragging because you, you are as good as your weakest link. And so when you, when you, when you, when you do that, it makes space for something bigger to come along. It's interesting, you know, to think that way that the consumer or that the client needs to understand that they're expendable. Yeah. And, and. I don't know. It's a weird culture, you know, where we go back. Interesting how you're, you're talking human to human, and we've talked about the social culture, social media, and so forth. But the empowerment, or I'm going to say entitlement, that that's brought to people, that people can kind of get online, and you know, you like you said, you post something about your successes, or you know, what you're doing from your health and fitness perspective, and then all of a sudden, there's ten people that show up to tell you how you're doing it wrong, mm. and no consequence, no consequence to that. They can say and do whatever they want, and that is a downside to this human to human concept going back to your Ted talk and the jaw dropping that was happening with, Oh boy, you know, customers can say whatever they want about us true or not. Uh, and that's become a very dangerous premise because now a lot of things can be manufactured with no basis whatsoever for a company or for a, for a coach or for an individual, you know, whatever. And, and they can, Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Yet a coach or a cus or a, a, excuse me, a, a company is left to have to defend themselves over what? Over something that somebody said. It can instantly, mm -hmm. can instantly go viral. We've seen a lot of stuff. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of things happen in this last year. It's been a crazy year. Mm -hmm. Elections and politics and COVID and all kinds of things. And it's been a, um, it's been tumultuous at a lot of levels. I think it's really sad to see kind of where we're at, but as a as a country i think number one it makes me really sad to kind of see how divided we are on on so many things but it's just been people casting stones back and forth and these social platforms have been really the medium to do that and yes we've got we've got other other media outlets to do that but where do you see this going man with your experience and kind of how the thing has shifted so fast you know again 2015 i mean it's, it was like yesterday mm -hmm. where do you think where do you see this thing shifting and what's it going to take in order to maybe right that ship uh, to where we're maybe back to where Facebook was when we started, which was, hey, we're just coming on to see where our friends are, maybe have a little conversation and share pictures of our, of our cats and, and things like that. Does it ever go back or are we, are we fucking doomed? Like, this is just, it's, a, it's disaster and it cannot be averted at this point. Mm. Yeah, I don't think it'll be righted in the way that you th you're you're saying um, there's a shift that won't come back in the way that we once had it. So sh Facebook will always be. Um, what, so here's the thing: once once social platforms introduce any kind of form of money, um, money for ads, an ad network of any kind replaces the reason for why that that social platform was was invented um facebook was first um neutral natural and and fun because there was no money involved right. it wasn't a platform of of re-engaging old a rekindling of re relationships where we were like scott i haven't seen you for years right. and, and and when it was fun and we just loved it and then ads and money change that same thing for twitter same thing for um L linkedin although linkedin's a little more business so it hasn't gotten there quite there yet it, it's it's trending but it, that but way it will. yeah um clubhouse is a new one right. there, now notice and i love clubhouse right now but um but the reason that it hasn't gone to that side is because there's, there's no, no incentive. money right. right the money hasn't gotten there yet so Will it will it go back? No, because money they're not going to remove money. No, nope. or they're going to take money out of their pockets. They can't no. exist. Right. Um, and you know, you look at Instagram is probably the the golden child right now because it it's not in your face that money is present. Um, it's not totally in your face. Like it's 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 definitely they preserved the the 
the the entity um now you do see sponsored ads but it's it, they did a good job of preserving it enough that um we're not seeing the ads um pop up on a right hand column and it's just it, you know the the ads look they're still uh, there natural yeah they're just not as obvious and obnoxious as they may have been before right and and the thing about instagram is it's more about beauty and sharing your 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 moments and there's not a lot of um engagement now where i think facebook right now and the reason that facebook is hanging on the most is because of their groups um if you want to if you want to grow your business right now on any platform grow a group um a group is just still vital a vital community to just about anything you can do in um in your business and it's it's just a just a great way to grow i got a question though can i time you out there for just a second so you're, you're growing your group and you've got this this community that you've grown on facebook and essentially it's on another platform and what we're seeing with the deplatforming of certain people and I wouldn't have anything to share on there that would be, you know, in a, in a group format that would be deep platform. But the simple fact of the matter is, is I don't really own that group. I don't own that community there. Facebook does. And if they decide to change things or they don't like something that somebody said or whatever else, because that's, that's the world we're living in right now, it could essentially just go away. Should I be fearful of that? Because I am. I I want to. I want to own my content. I want to own my platform. I want to own my community in the sense that I have control and there's not a third party there that's toggling switches that says, well, this part of work, you've got this community, we have this group and you're putting out this message and only a certain portion of those people might see that message. And only a certain portion of these people over here might see this message. That to me is a little, a little scary. Should I be scared of that? I don't think so. Uh, growing a community off Facebook is harder than growing it on Facebook. Um, I've tested it. Growing a community on Facebook, um, what 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 you're saying has validity. It's really hard knowing that they could shut it down or they could go go away. They won't do that because it's the only reason that Facebook actually it really exists right now, in my opinion. Um, it's it's the, the one groups. main reason that mm -hmm. they actually are still Facebook because the main timeline actually isn't giving as much value anymore right. as it as it as the main reason yeah. it actually originally existed. Facebook groups is the is how they're seeing the future of Facebook, the the Facebook entity. So groups is the future of Facebook. Why would they shut it down? Number two is if they did, I don't really care about as much all the content and the stuff that went on what i care about is the actual engagement and culture of what became that community mm -hmm. it's what is in the community and the relationships of the community and once i've built that can i move it the stuff that really matters oh my god yeah because i've if i've captured it correctly then the next community wherever that is um no problem it will come along because well, Clubhouse just came along and they have 6 million users and it's only on iPhone so far. They haven't even done Android. Yet, yeah. um, and, and I'm having a blast over there. So can I move it over there? Sure. Can I move it to LinkedIn groups if they ever get that going and off the ground? Sure. Can I, where will I move it? That'll happen. I don't know where I, I can't quite vision that yet, but it's going to show itself. And where will I move it? I'll, I'll tell you then. But um, right now it's there mm -hmm. and that's where it needs to grow. And will it shut down soon? No, probably, probably not. not. Mm -hmm. So you've got the, again, the platforms or social media in general outside of the, the groups piece. Well, again, we're, we're not going to really write this ship in the way that we used to see it, where people were really connecting there and rekindling old relationships because you're either kind of on or you're off social media and you're just going from one platform to the next and you have your little, the people that you communicate on one, one platform. From Yeah, I mean, you're finding people are picking their favorite platform and just being in that one place. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you're finding your people. One person's favorite spot is Instagram, one for person's right. Instagram, one person's LinkedIn, one person's Clubhouse. Right. Clubhouse. Um, so that's, and it's usually around, you know, personal business, health, whatever right. it is, they're finding their platform and that's where they're inclusive. Um, you're seeing a lot of people leave social altogether um, and that's um, for their health, mm -hmm. which I'm totally behind. 
Uh, both of my kids, ironically, aren't even on social altogether. So we've got that whole generation coming up. It's kind of weird that most of my kids aren't even on it. Yeah, I know my 19 year old will turn it off for long periods of time, you know? I, and I think, you know, just turn it back on and turn it off and turn it on. But it's interesting how that happens. And you know, she doesn't, she doesn't lose her friends because she's turned off. It's great. Turned it off, right? Yeah. Uh, listen, Brian, I, I think this is actually a good, really, a really good place to, to kind of stop. Um, I think at the end of this, you know, if I could ask you to, you know, with all the things that you've shared today, and you've certainly been influential and you've made a huge impact on me um, as a as a as a friend, but also from a business perspective, I, I'm constantly learning. I love being sort of the white belt, you know, in things, and you're always kind of in, in front of stuff. Um, you got any new projects you're working on outside of the coaching that you can maybe I don't know, maybe let the cat out of the bag here on or something. Hmm. Um, well, I'm moving into group coaching now, so that's my, cool. my, my next thing. And, um, I just did a beta, beta group coach, uh, that turned out it, it, we're in our final two weeks. And so I'm about to turn that on publicly more. So, uh, that'll be evergreen and that's going to release the early part of April. And, um, so that's going to be exciting. And then I'm starting to work on a third book. And it's taken me five years to, to work on it. It has a lot to do with what I went through over the last uh, four or five years. Nice. And that's about small shifts, which is a lot about my podcast. So uh, it's small shifts that can create big outcomes. Instead of piv p uh, finding pivots, big pivots that we have to all make and thinking I have to make big changes. It's like, what are the small things that we can do? That'll make big changes. And so what can we do both in companies like big companies, middle company, or middle market companies, small companies like like yours and mine. Mm -hmm. And um, and then as indi as individuals, what are what are things that we can do that are small that will still have resounding effects on um, on things that we we can do that still at any parts of our life we can we can see happen and kick ass. Right. I'll look forward to that third book. Yeah. Thanks. If people want to work with you, how should they reach out to you? How should they find it? How should they get one of these 90 minute one on ones with Brian so they can. So you guys can establish whether or not you're the right fit and whether or not uh, you guys should move forward together. Thanks, man. Um, easy. You can email me. Um, I'm pretty human to human. So just email me at Brian with a Y at Brian Creamer dot com. Brian with a Y. Kramer with a K. It's funny. Last week I was talking to my dad and I said um, to him because he was like writing something down and I told him Brian with a Y, Kramer with a K and he goes, I named you? Yeah, Brian. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, email me, Brian at BrianKramer.com or it's at BrianKramer.com is my website and there's a contact us there if you'd prefer to. I, I, there's actually a way you can schedule time with me on the site through the coaching page there. So either, Brilliant. either way. Brilliant. Yeah. Brian, so happy that you were able to come down today. I really appreciate the time you spent with me. I always do, man. Yeah. Man. Are you kidding? This is awesome. If I wish everybody could see the setup in this place, it's like, um, it's like Joe Rogan on steroids. <laughs> he wishes he could be here. <laughs> that's, that's a lot, but thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, hopefully we can encourage more people to come down and have conversations like this, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's good to do this after all these years and have a nice conversation and deep one at that. Cheers, Brian. Cheers. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Iron Sights. If you enjoyed our conversation, you can support our mission by hitting the subscribe button, leaving a review, and sharing the podcast with a friend. I'll see you on the next episode.